Get cracking! It is time for the burning platform. Yeah, Gareth, I only got one of the bangers that aircon. Yeah, it's too cold. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Too cold, too hot. It's too cold. I mean, it's too big and not enjoy. Just. All right, all right, all right. Just right, five right, right. minutes. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Hang just on. Just five minutes, and then then we'll turn it what up again. Says Bumi as she takes off her jacket. All right. Well, we're gonna get. Uh, let me get Canton on camera here, so you can see uh, that he actually exists this morning. Let me just see if I can find you. There, there, we, there we are. He exists. Yes. I do need not a virtual canton today. And I'm, I'm hearing double of canton. What? What, what is? Like, what, what happened, happened in the studio last night? Honestly. One two one two. One two one two. Talk to me. It's a little bit of a an echo, but right. Very, uh, the studio is like a disaster zone. Or something. I don't know what the hell is happening in here. Anyway, sabotaging the IFP. They're sabotaging the IFP. They're sabotaging the IFP. Get Jenny. I can't even get for that one. No, it's you brought this energy on yourself. You brought this energy on yourself. You must walk in and own it. Yeah, listen, we're we're talking IFP this morning, but let's let's get cracking. So we've got lots. Just a lot of people uh, in the studio this morning, and we are going to talk as we have to the leaders of various political parties. Today is no exception. And today it is the turn of the IFP, and I'm very, very pleased to welcome to the studio the chairperson of the Standing Committee on Public Accounts. He also became a member of the National Assembly in 2012, has served on the Scopa Committee since 2014. He's Mkule who is a member of the National Assembly. For the Inkata Freedom Party. How are you? Very well, thanks. Good morning. All right, uh, you, you, you came in here, you were a bit down. Uh, you said, oh, it's very tough. You're going through a hard time, election season. Nothing a good coffee can't fix. It's ah, early yeah. morning. All right, so, that makes yeah. me happy. Yeah, so very thanks good. for the coffee. No, no thank, thank you for coming. Go, go. All, All right, right, so, so how are things going in the, in the IFP? What's, what's been happening with you guys? What's, what's, I see lots of good for Schengen. Schengen. I love it, the hashtag. <laughs> well, I mean... We, this is our first election without Principal Tilezi. Um, and a lot of speculation about the party's stability and sustainability into the future. Um, and there was a lot of um, speculation around him. Um, and so we came to assure him uh, that things are going well. Um, and dedicating this is our commitment to sustaining his lifelong legacy um, of service, um, patriotic. Um, duty and servant leadership in the country. Um, and uh, President Lepis is firmly at the helm of the IFP and we are leading a solid campaign and we are quite confident that if we do the things we have committed ourselves to do and we execute our plans, um, we should have a, a good election. But obviously, um, it's all about the hard work and the lifelong commitment that Prince Mutilezi gave was hard work. And so that's what we're doing. Obviously, it's not just about the individual. It's also the policy proposition we're placing on the table. That's why we launched our manifesto, of course, on the 10th of March, 13-point plan. I refer to him. I mean, listen, and you said uh, you miss him. Uh, you, you miss Mungosu uh, Tupotelezi. And I think a lot of us do. He was, like a, he was a feature of the political landscape, which we quite liked. And... He was a voice of reason. Uh, he was a wise elder. There's a lot of that. But it does kind of also have overtones of Kim Il-sung and the necrocracy that they have in uh, North Korea. I mean, just that we have to move on. And IFPs, uh, Pumi, you brought it up a number of times. It's like your succession plan. You do it with all of the parties. Like there isn't one for the UDM or Kenneth Meshwe. And the IFP, I mean, you had a very successful rally in Itequini. I saw that. A hugely successful rally. Everybody underestimated the turnout for the IFP. Looking very good. KZN, obviously, a battleground state. So there's a lot in the offing here. But many people are still unaware of who else is in the IFP. You know? That's why I'm glad you're here this morning to explain well, some of this stuff. I'm not sure if that uh, would be a. An honest reading of the situation, given that the IFP had a conference in August 2019, and so certainly nothing like um, North Korea. We had a conference, delegates elected a leadership. 
and it was widely covered. And not, by the way, I'm not being insulting. No, no, no. I just, I just mean, when, when you land in, when you land in North Korea, as a few people traveled there will know, the first thing they do is they take you to the, the mausoleum of Kim Il sung, who is still the head of state in North Korea, and then you pay your respects to him. And even though he's been dead since the 70s, mm. he's still the head of state. And I don't want the IFP in like 10, 15 years' time, and I wish you well in this election. May you grow and grow. But if you're in 10, 15 years' time still doing it for Schenge, then there's a bit of a problem, right? No, oh, no, I think I explained the context of the job sure. for Schenge at the outset. And the only reason why I was making reference to um, North Korea was to give the contrast of the democratic sure. outlook. Uh, which prevails um, in the party. The party is growing. Um, you know, right now, um, the office of the Secretary General has got a backlog of some over 1,000 branches that need to be inaugurated. And why we're not moving at a fast pace is because we're actually in election uh, mode. Secondly, um, is that the succession planning in the party, as far as we are concerned, has been very stable. You'll recall Prince Bishop has led the party for 44 years. So it's not going to be an overnight transition. You need to create um, familiarity for the structures. You need to adjust to the new normal, which of course was compounded by um, his passing. Again, the leadership under President Labiesa, as far as we are concerned, continues to do um, good work. And I think that um, he is the man for the moment and the man for these times, understanding that this is a transition period. Obviously, the party is due for a conference um, post-August 2024, after the last conference every five years. And the party structures will pronounce themselves again. So what was important during this time is to manage a transition, but also to imagine an IFP without Prince Mutilezi physically mm -hmm. right, in his presence. And so that's a difficult exercise, um, given the fact that the Prince was a towering figure um, in the IFP. No doubt. Um, and I do believe that um, we, we are doing the work that needs to be done. And the, the structures are, are, are getting there um, when, when moving forward. So there is a futuristic outlook. Um, for the party, and I think it's going well. Obviously, yes, we're going to draw a lot of criticism. I think that's very fascinating that that you have this backlog of branches that are growing, and you're talking about a growing party because we have seen the party declining. Yeah. Particularly from kind of '94, you were one of the biggest parties, and today you're sitting with 14 seats. It has been on that downward trajectory. What do you attribute the growth to? Well, it's the hard work. So the, the, we arrested the electoral decline in 2016 um, in the local government elections. You'll recall in 2011, we only won two municipalities, mm. which was Ulundi and Msingna, disastrous because of the NFP split uh, that, that happened. Um, and 2014 was a terrible year for the IFP. And I recall uh, that Prince Putin, as I said, we had not gone out as part of the motivation to the leadership of the party. Um, and Mr. Sabisa, in prison now, was the mm -hmm. provincial secretary of the IFP Muslim Hotel. And it was quite a long story short, just to say, by the time we arrived in 2011 to 2016, the next local government elections, through a concerted effort on the ground and through by elections that were occurring, we arrived in 2016 with um, 13. Uh, municipalities. So we, we began arresting that decline. 10 seats in 2014 and uh, 14 uh, seats uh, in 2019. So it's been going, it's been working the ground and hence um, this backlog that we're talking about. There's been a lot of experience uh, that has come out um, for us in the party. I'll make one final example. You recall in 2011, we did not manage to register elections in Umzumbi, the south coast of Oslo, Natal. Mm -hmm. The IEC then granted us, um, or granted a, what do call, a special dispensation, or we were able to register, then they went to court and then were taken out. So we won't continue. The turning point for the IFP was that, because Prince Bruce directed that a rally must be held in Umzumbi, where you had this. He went there to say, we as the leader take responsibility for what happened to our structures, and we are sorry. That confidence of a leadership taking responsibility set the tone for the party moving forward, and it's part of our country leadership happened. And so that is why we're now governing 25 municipalities. Wow. Um, in Wales, now, in a series of elections, we've taken 50 
words from the ANC since 2021, and they have taken one. And we're taking words even in areas who were previously uh, not strong. But I conclude by saying, what most of you have done. Before we carry on, I'm going to kind of preempt Tommy on something here because she always gets the good questions in before I have a chance to. <laughs> so, so KZN is such an interesting place uh, for us to talk about political movements, and it's going to be hotly contested. We've got essentially a number of things that will give voters options they didn't have before, and there are so many people vying for those votes. So obviously the big three are you guys, MK, and the ANC. ANC have got a tough battle ahead of them because maybe MK is going to steal some of their support. They've also got a track record, which has not always been good. So people have got something to judge them against. Uh, we've got the IFP, which has maybe performed well in some of the places that they've governed. Other, other places, it still remains to be seen. As you said, there are some that are fairly new uh, municipalities to you. And then there's the relationship between like the Zulu monarchy, and we saw this situation with the prime minister of the Zulu monarchy being kind of cut out by the ANC guy in a speech. There was a lot of controversy around that. Uh, people saying that bad it's behavior. disrespectful, bad behavior. bad behavior. So how does the IFP factor all of this into its campaigning? And how do you see the opposition? And by the opposition, I mean those other big two parties, because You've said that in certain municipalities you'd be willing to ally yourself with party X or Y yeah. in order to make things happen. Look, the, the Zulu monarchy uh, situation predates the IFP, right? So Prince Bateliazi became the traditional prime minister um, in 1956. Yo. 56, 56. The IFP is founded in 1975. So he comes into this political party space and mobilization space carrying that head. Also the fact that he's the grandson of King Dinozulu and so on. So he wears these multiple hats. The outlook of the party has been to say we need uh, by all means possible ensure that the Zulu royal family and any other royal family rises above politics and we keep it at a distance. And so we maintain... The, the reality that we are a political party and the accessibility to the monarchy is for everybody. We certainly are not mobilizing um, around it. The announcement of Reverend Tulasus of Tilezi as the traditional prime minister did come as a surprise um, to us. We weren't anticipating that. And so the... By the, by the way, is that the prerogative of the king? That's the prerogative of the king. And so we were like, okay, oh, congrats, uh, Rev TD. But you so he you, has yeah, so he but he's got a, a, a functional example to emulate. The prince was fundamentally able to separate the two um, in the operations of the party. But we must not be lost to the reality that the IFP almost did not contest elections in 1994 on the key question of traditional leadership. So then that's where you find the dichotomy because. We wanted clarity, which we still want, in the powers, functions, and responsibilities of traditional leadership and governance the country. And that's why the Cabinet Committee of December 2000, chaired by then Deputy President Zuma, recommended that Chapter 7 and 12 of the Constitution be amended to provide that clarity. Why? You've got wall-to-wall -wall municipal systems in South Africa, right? So every corner of the country is in a municipality. In those municipalities, you've got traditional leaders and traditional governance throughout the country. So there's a there's an overlap in terms um, of governance and systems which are all recognized constitutionally. And so if in the constitution all you do is recognize traditional leadership but don't define what it is that they're supposed to be doing and how they do it, you've got a problem. So it, it is one of the areas where the IFP is focused um, on. So that may then, uh, in certain instances, say, uh, should we, you know, th th there's an overlap. It we, we deal with the matter purely from a policy principle point of view that the construct of the country should be in this way. Do we get involved in the affairs of the royal families and traditionally? No, we don't. So, so I think that's the question. Which begs the question then: What would be your policy standpoint in terms of how you would define those roles? Well, amongst others, you've got traditional courts which are administering justice every day in the country. So and, and how do you see those coexisting? Uh, well, they, they, they have to be 
integrated into the justice system. You know, you've got referrals, you've got court hierarchies, magistrates, high courts, Supreme Court, and so on and so forth. So how do you handle matters that would have come from there, which are handled um, in terms of custom and law? Of course, they have to meet constitutional master, the decisions and processes that are followed, but there has to be some sort of convergence and dovetailing um, of the two. Um, secondly, is to say, and the municipal style of governance right now requires that we also some sort of working together and collaboration um, insofar as what happens. So we need to thresh this out. And I think that the law, because you see, here's the thing, constitutionally we recognize the structure, but in what form it takes, you have not defined. So it exists. It, 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 you're paying taxpayer money into it. Traditional leaders are paid, these in Dune are paid. Um, you use it to, you know, rally a traditional arts, culture, heritage, so on mm. and so forth. So it, it, it's playing a role in society. Traditional courts are, you know, administering, they administering land, by the way, we've got the issue of the Ingunama Trust and so on and so forth. So they're doing a lot in government, but you've not defined it. So it's sort of, Ad hoc, and we think that is is, is dangerous and irresponsible for it uh, to be in the constitution, but outside of governance. So what we really are working towards is putting together a framework of operation, and I'm pretty certain that in the seventh parliament, a private member's bill um, will certainly serve before parliament in terms of how we do that and push for the constitutional amendments. The clarity is important. Right. So, because we're now talking about some of these policies, for you as the IFP and your manifesto, you were talking about the launch thereof, which happened last month. What are your top three priorities that you think voters should be paying attention to? Well, we, the issue of jobs in the economy um, is very, very important because you have got an unemployment rate that is just soaring and staggering. You've got economic growth that is literally stagnant, 0.1% and so on. Um, and yet you have invested. So the whole thing for us is like a conveyor belt, right? Please say things because there is a sound issue. Yeah, okay. He's, he's sound working sound. on it, but okay. you so, continue. So for us, it's a conveyor belt, right? If you're going to be making an investment into young people, in terms of education, you even have NSFAS, by the way, who is so you've got all these graduates. When I'm graduated and you've paid money, me sitting at home is wasting expenditure to the state because the whole point is that invest in me so that I can be productive and be able to contribute to the tax base and so on and so forth. So for us, the economy and jobs are of critical importance. The whole notion, I know it's probably like a a refrain in societal discourse, but we must create a conducive and enabling environment for businesses to operate. What does that what mean? That yes. We need to fix the electricity, right? Load shedding uh, is a hindrance and a deterrent for investment and growth. So for us, the energy mix, and that is very, very important. Independent power producers, we need to move with heightened speed in that. Coal remains the backbone um, of, 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 of the energy supply. You need to be able to come with the necessary skills, knowledge, and expertise, which means you need to revamp your education system. In fact, we believe that we need to open up more spaces for education. Amongst the, the education um, section, you'll find a point which says, um, take out this LO uh, syllabus or curriculum element as a, a, an examinable uh, aspect and replace it with entrepreneurial development. So LO is part of um, societal or soft skills, whatever you call it, is important. But what's the point of me studying writing exams and when I get to an institution of higher learning, the points of value don't count. So we're saying the, 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 the direction of the economy requires entrepreneurial thinking. And people make the mistake that we're saying everybody must be a business person. No, no, no. It takes two to tango. Entrepreneurial education is also about the ability of creating functional workers um, in your business space. So th that is the kind of thinking that we have. Secondly, is the issue of crime, right? Because we, we, we believe that a crime in itself is taking away from society. So I know that crime may be seen as the violent crimes, but drugs, 
human trafficking, child trafficking, cross-border crimes, and so on and so forth, all of them combined are making it very, very difficult for there to be any sense of stability um, in the country. Um, and you are going to have a runaway train um, of a society where people will end up taking defenses into their own hands. So we are calling for a devolution of policing powers, functions, and responsibilities uh, to, provinces, to the provinces. Yeah, to the provinces and further to um, districts, uh, area commissions, as it was uh, called uh, then, because a, a, a crime-fighting strategy from a desktop exercise in some boardroom in Pretoria is not going to solve the problems of crime in Umkanduli and so on. But beyond that, we are saying don't throw financial solutions to non-financial problems. So is it a matter of money? Is it a matter of strategy? Because you need to sort that out. Strategy informs your budget. So to say that you're going to give you more money, but without a strategy, for us, it it does it does it doesn't work. So that is um, area uh, number two. And then that for us, it's the issue of access and accessibility to everything and anything. So your infrastructural, spatial planning, human settlements, all, all those things are important. It's about fixing infrastructure. It's about ensuring that you fix the railway lines. It's, those are the basic things, your road to rail. I often come to Johannesburg, will um, drive up from Durban to Joburg. The N3 is, a, I mean, I don't know what to call it. It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a block cooler, um, you know? <laughs> And and, and 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 the risks and the dangers that are there. Um, I remember one day, and this is the final thing. I'm just speaking about infrastructure development, so water mm. access, uh, sure. uh, reticulation, and all those things. For us, is to say, you need to go back to basics. So driving from Durban going to was going to something in Bergville. We spent about three four hours on the road simply because the trucks. Right? So we are saying road to rail is a crucial and essential uh, part of ease of movement. Also just to make the ports accessible. So it, mm. And it's about, let me say maybe one final thing. Prasa and Transnet have to work together. Right? This thing that there's Prasa lines and Transnet lines, mm. uh, hello, you're both SOEs. You, you, it, it, it basic logic tells us that collaboration in the conveyor belt of economic growth and development is required from these strategic areas. So the economy, crime, and accessibility through functional and effective infrastructure well, for us is important. Like you've read my book with you quoting on the uh, plans that I put in place for rail transportation. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but, uh, but I, I digress a bit on, uh, on that. So the, you know, to the point, for example, with regard to the N3, you might remember that there was a significant plan that was in place roughly 20 years ago to reroute the N3 through De Beers Pass, which um, if you're heading north on the N3 currently and you turn right into Ladysmith, De Beers Pass is a couple of kilometers up the road from there and it would shave a substantial distance, eliminate Van Rienen's Pass as the traffic uh, disaster that it is currently. And the only reason why this project was shelved was because the ANC bowed to pressure from the Free State faction, which said that Harry Smith would then effectively die, which is true, because Harry Smith right now is kind of this, this satellite town. But uh, let, let's look in terms of the progress. And uh, yes, I've noted the progress that uh, the IFP has made, particularly in terms of the municipalities. There's been, uh, and in some municipalities, you've also got very successful collaboration with the DA, which has effectively kept uh, the ANC out of power. But I'd, I'd like you to address the, the Jacob Zuma factor, because uh, I think that in the absence of MK, I was fairly confident that the IFP was going to end up securing a majority in the province. And now I'm not so sure. I'd like you to address how you think uh, Jacob Zuma is likely to affect your overall performance, but more importantly, on the assumption that each of you end up with a significant chunk of the pie, how do you see that working together from a policy perspective? Well, you see, I'm really loath to speak about the Zuma thing. But you, because you have to. Uh, no, no, tell us why. Because, hmm. because I'm not sure what it stands for. Nope. No, the, no, the, no one has. Yeah, no right. one knows so, what it stands for. Yeah. So we, we, we are therefore unable to 
correctly and holistically assess it. All we know is that there is a Jacob Zuma-led MK party, um, which is gaining traction, um, and we are yet to see how it organizes and structures itself on the ground, right? So that that's all we've got going. Is it taken away uh, from the ANC? Definitely it is. Uh, we have picked up that um, in certain parts, we have got, uh, uh, we are shaving some support to it. So in the final analysis, we are treating the MK party just like any other political party on the ballot. We're contesting everyone. And that is why, um, as you say, there was sort of a clarity in terms of the outlook. We are redoubling our efforts to go back to the basics to say um, that there's this new factor. So for us, it's about strengthening our own internal operations. So it's about an IFP that says whether you are MK, ANC, DA, whoever, we're contesting you. Um, and we, we, are, we are going to, we're going all out presenting a value proposition which needs to respond to the electorate in, its, in, 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 in this diversity to bring everyone um, together. Um, so yes, the, the Zuma thing, okay, respectfully, the MK party led by Mr. Zuma, Zuma is, thing. <laughs> is, uh, uh, is something to look at, right? We, 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 we cannot, you know, continue with and pretend as though it's not there. But it's, it's a difficult uh, animal to understand because uh, you, you, and I, I must hasten to say, in fairness to the MK party and to Mr. Zuma, Mr. Zuma has not come out and said anything about us. It is, he's not gone on an onslaught or an assault or an affront towards um, the IFP. So that in itself has meant there's very little or zero interaction between us and the MK party. Yes, we meet, uh, smile and wave, saubona, saubona, and it ends there. But in the final analysis, whether it's the MK party, the DA, or the ANC, we are contesting everybody on that ballot. Speaking of coalitions, you are part of the MPC. Yeah. So when John Stian Hazen comes out two weeks ago in an interview and says a partnership or coalition with the ANC is probably the best outcome that they, how do you feel as a member of the MPC <laughs> to hear a major part of the MPC saying, actually, we would go with the opposition in a coalition. What does that do to your <laughs> partnership and to the way that you see going into a coalition going forward? You know, I'm laughing. Yesterday there was an MPC event. Um, I was not there because I was, I've been deployed here. I was here on other matters yesterday in Joburg. So I, then I get like the daily brief of the, notes. the outcomes, the notes. And President Lamesa says uh, that the responsible thing to do is to leave all options available on the table, including but not limited to the ANC. Mm -hmm. So... And 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 the and the reality of that comes from our assessment to say coalitions one are difficult. Two, they may not give you a clear roadmap to governance, right? And so you end up having to onload uh, other people whom you would have ordinarily not wanted to work with. Let me even take it a step back and say that the IFP position remains that it was not prudent. Um, for Mr. Stian Hazen and the DA to come out and say, we will not work with the EFF. We didn't think that was correct um, because by doing so, you were already forming a government before an election and without having a due regard to what the outcome could have been. So we were of the view and still maintain that um, the EFF should have been invited um, to the multi-party uh, charter uh, processes um, because uh, ours is to fix the country, right? And quite frankly, right now, nobody's going to come out with a clear uh, majority if the polls are anything to go by. So the final Correct. point is to say um, we will need to do a holistic assessment of the results because what South Africans must not find themselves in is an in, is, is political party inability to form government. That would be the, t the tragedy of the outcomes of the election. So we have to form governments 
uh, after uh, the elections. And so I'm going to relook at the, the, the construct of the argument that President Sabisa uh, presented yesterday. But I, 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 I'm, I'm aware now that um, the discussions that we've been having about the kind of animal of elections is to say um, we may... I'm not saying we will, but we may. It's, it's something to consider because the reality is the elections may change the dynamics within the ANC completely. Um, I don't see a situation where they're gonna, there's going to be a hard-headedness uh, to not compromise change and so on. So it's, it's, it's early days. All I would say to the leadership of all parties, including the IFP, is to say, let us go to the elections. The MPC, in our view, is a necessary platform for discussions in anticipation of an eventuality that may arise. So we're not found wanting. So it's good to talk now, to understand each other. <clears throat> I mean, the DA says no to uh, PE and so on. No, we, we can't have that kind of situation because a race-based past, right, and please hear me well here, will require race-based interventions to correct them. So it's not a blanket thing, right? But you have to be alive to the realities that took place. What is the issue with PE? The issue with PE is not PE, but it is implementation and the corruption taking place therein. So unless you are strong within uh, the pushback uh, and fight against crime, then um, BE, just like any other policy, becomes susceptible to corruption. So that's what we need to do. I want to just ask you about something here. Uh, one of our comments is from Azalea. She says, um, I want to vote for people like you, meaning you, um, but I feel as though I'm not a part of your tribe. We want the same things, but I'm not Zulu. I do not live in KwaZulu-Natal. I mean, this is something the IFP has dealt with for a very long time. There are many policies that the IFP would be uh, attractive to many people for. Um, why is it that you are unable in some situations, including the Zalias here, and I don't want to just throw her out and say she's ignorant, but... Do you appeal enough to people outside of KZN and people who are not Zulu? Well, all parties have got a base and we are coming from a position of uh, weakness in that we are rebuilding a party that was almost disseminated, no, decimated, so English, decimated in 2011. <laughs> Your English so, is so, <laughs> so we are fixing... Uh, the party, right? So we had to go back to basics. And we're strong in Guazlu Natal, but uh, I can tell Zelia that one, we're not a Zulu party. Mm. I think that is very, very important to put out there. In fact, tribal politics is very dangerous for any society in any country, and we certainly will not subscribe to it. But at the same time, the the, the bird things of the IFP are at a time when there was the balkanization project of the country by uh, the apartheid regime. And so it sort of wanted to configure a political mobilization ar around that. In fact, in 1977, Prince Wittles was summoned to the union buildings to be told not to mobilize uh, outside the Zulu people, and he told them to go and jump. And that is why we were having political events well outside Guazlu Natal, Free State, Cape Town, and so on as part of that mobilization. <clears throat> so I can assure Zelia that moving forward, the next phase of the IFP is a far more robust and comprehensive national expansion program. I'm pretty confident that the efforts led by the Deputy National Chairperson, Mam TP, in Pumalanga, Mystic Wala, deployed to Limpopo in the uh, Northwest. You've got deployed teams in the Free State and so on and so It's all gaining traction. So we are on this drive to make sure that we spread our wings. Obviously, um, Gauteng is our second biggest fishing pond and um, we've got our provincial rally here and you are invited on the 14th um, of of April, the details I'm going to release tomorrow um, about that. We've got the KZN launch um, in a, a, on Sunday, and we're actually going to be having provincial rally. So on the 1st of May, we are in Pumalanga. Um, Free State is finalizing um, their operations as well. So um, Western Cape Advocate Anthony Mitchell with Mr. Singh, our Treasurer General, are leading efforts there as well. So there is this commitment and dedication by the party uh, to, 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 
to, to, to spread wings. Final point is this. Every party has a base. Where we are strong right now, that we need to get KZN so that we can be able to demonstrate our ability to govern as part of the uh, uh, onward project to say, people look, like, we can... Uh, people like a winner. So they want to see someone who wins exactly. at, a, at a provincial level at least. Right? So we want, to, we want to really use and model that. And that is why, um, the, the, I mean, the Political Oversight Committee is now working on a new reporting uh, framework for service delivery monitoring in the municipalities that we govern. And in Costa Rica, the chairperson, <clears throat> excuse me, has been very clear about uh, a far more, you know, stringent uh, 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 approach and, you know, more consequence management in councils where the IFP is not performing to our satisfaction as the leadership to say we rallied around the point of trust, trust us. And so if you are not going to do the things we've committed to, you are taking a steps backwards. So there's a hard drive in that as well to say the trust has to translate into service delivery. You're talking about a not just a growing IFP, but also because we see the by-elections, we talk about them with Gareth all the time, but also mm -hmm. that you are beginning to resonate, you see, yourselves resonating to a wider audience. So how do you see your chances going into this election? Where are you pegging yourselves? We're not, um, what am I called, this thing of targets and so on. Oh, we, we need to register growth and we need to be able to exercise uh, influence in whatever uh, arrangement, let me call it that, but some people prefer the term coalition, some prefer co cooperation, whatever you call it, the arrangement. We need a sizable uh, uh, influence there. So the IFP definitely needs to move from the 14 seats uh, that that we have. Also, <clears throat> we, 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 we as a party believe uh, that our expansion project, project is going to take a lot of us uh, as well. So that is why you are finding campaigning running parallel to the mobilization of structures uh, so that uh, we grow. Let me make one example because I'm reminded on what you're saying, uh, the expansion and what Zelia said. Uh, many years ago, um, somebody said to me, I don't look IFP. And what and I said, and I said, what does that mean? And they said, well, you're young and the IFP is for old people. So amongst others, the whole drive has been about changing perceptions around the IFP. There and was then, a comment about you earlier. Mm -hmm. Someone said, oh, they really like the sound of you, but what are you doing in an old party? So it's to your point. Well, I mean, the party is not old at all now. If you look at our <laughs> membership, um, the current stats of membership and the SG um, was supposed to be releasing the numbers because the growth is there, is that just over 80% of IFP members are young people. Um, so if you, I mean, and if you go to any of any activity that you are doing, um, the IFP is really um, growing in that space. You see, the only difference with the IFP and probably other parties is that we are not quick on the draw, deliberately so, of you know this these aggressive public campaigns because we are still rebuilding structures. I think there must not be an underestimation of the extent to which the NFP factor dealt us a blow in terms of well, our structure uh, mobilization. Sanele in the comments actually gives you credit. Says this guy just admitted his party was decimated. The formation of the Maguaza Masibi party. No, it was. Um, I mean, no politician alive would admit this or anything. Frankly, I would vote for this guy based on his honesty. But also, there's something to be said. Like, why should we always have these huge knee-jerk reactions from politicians instead of a more thoughtful, paced, you know, well-founded, reasoned? perspective. They all feel like they have to react like this. You know, one of the crit criticisms I face as the IFP spokesperson is that uh, uh, Joe Soap will drop and die now. And in two minutes, I'm going to get a call from a media house. Your reaction, please. I mean... <laughs> I just I don't understand. Um, I mean, a, a councillor will get killed, and that's the other challenge we have in Wales Natal currently. And I'm very sad in that another NC councillor was killed in Pumalanga as well. And I just think um, we need to really do more and far better as a country in so far as this is concerned. But that will happen, and the news breaks, and then they say, you want your comment? And I say, one, we haven't even spoken to the family. I'm sure the family still needs to consult 
it's people in form family members yeah. first. So I'm going to your issue that we we need to sort of tone down the tempo a little bit. I, 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 I we, with all due respect to my colleagues and counterparts in the media space, I really think we need to desist from a soundbite driven kind of media reporting. I believe the media is an important platform for public and civic education to dispense information correctly, rightly, without prejudice, fear or favor, put it out there, but not sound bites. So let me quickly take off the IFP ad and put on the Scopa ad. Scopa will deal with a complex matter and then say, oh, can you come on for three minutes? <laughs> I can't because I'm yeah. doing injustice to the issue. So I'm just going to your point. I'm sorry to digress, but I think it's so important that we encourage, and I believe the strength of this country and its democracy largely has been sustained because of the media, a free press. And credit to you guys. Um, I think that at times against all odds, you have endeavored to go out uh, there and tell difficult stories. But I think there is a need for some sort of internal reflection as well, just to check whether we are still on the right path. Have we become an educative platform or is it about the first one quick on the draw? Well, so I, I to, do I want us to, to talk about... This particular point for me. So, because I, I like what you've been saying so far in terms of the steps you've been taking to ensure that you're building a solid framework. Let's work on the assumption based on the numbers that we've been looking at, that there is going to be a coalition government in KZN immediately after these uh, these elections. You've already identified some of the issues. So the transportation infrastructure and the port systems is clearly a critical issue. The utter devastation in terms of the government of uh, of Durban, my hometown. Um, yes, the, the place is, it, it's a disaster. It makes me weep. These are, and, but to a large extent, even on the assumption that the IFP has a significant role in the provincial government. A lot of the competencies that have been responsible for the degradation of, uh, of the, uh, the province are national competencies and on the assumption that those are still under control of the uh, ANC. What can you do to actually fix the problems of Durban? Because the problems of Durban are the problems of the country, right? Because it is the inlet by which uh, everything moves in and out of the rest of the country. What are the practical things that you can do? So in terms of the water infrastructure in Durban, for example, it is a national competence. And um, how do you interfere with that? The port infrastructure is a national competence. Policing, again, to the killing of councillors is a national competence. Fixing the N3 is a national competence. Yeah, see, let me start off on a lighter note. You, you, you are a Durbanite. I'm a Durbanite. There's always the assumption that all IFP people are from are from the north. I'm a southerner, so that's just. <laughs> but you see, the, the, there's too much powers, functions, and responsibilities that reside in Pretoria unnecessarily. So, and hence our very clear uh, policy proposition that there needs to be a devolution of powers um, to provinces and municipalities, because. You, you, to run a country on the basis of a grant system, um, whether it's the municipal grant, the energy grant, or the water grant, to say national will come down. I mean, municipalities get less than 10% or roundabout of the national budget. It is not practical, right? It should so they, be exactly the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, if I were a one issue voter, this would be <clears> it. So we are very, and, and interestingly, in the State of the Nation address deba uh, debate, I think, no. This is 2023, 24, 22. I raised the issue in that Sona debate and President Raposa in the response was like, yes, Lengwa, you are right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing has happened here and here. We see this kind of thing. So there has to be a change. There has to be a, a, a competency devolution um, to, 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 to um, the, the, the municipalities. Water specifically, um, you are very right about that. Because but Mkolego, the thing for me is just, I, I mean, it's so obvious that the government affects you most critically closest to you. Yeah. And we pay our taxes in an inverse fashion. We fund the national government at 90% and our local government at 10 And as you and I both seem to agree, should be the other way around. Why is this so difficult for us to make happen as a nation? It doesn't, doesn't require us to be a federal state. 
No, it's it's uh, just apportioning the money to the right places. No, it's it, 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 it's it's ideological hard headedness because you see the nine the class of nineteen ninety four within the ANC sort of modeled itself in its thinking around China and Russia, and so this whole centralized, centralized uh, government power yeah, resides at the, the top. Way. Now, <clears throat> for us, that doesn't that that doesn't work. In fact, let me simplify the matter correctly and say, all development is local. In every material respect, every single thing takes place within, at most in government structure in a municipal ward. Whether it's a school, whether it's access to water, hospital, uh, a road, it's all there. If people have a problem anywhere in the country, they don't go and look for a minister. They look for the councillor, they go to the municipality. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to deploy the necessary knowledge, skills and expertise. And that's why amongst others, in, and going back to the issue you raised from about the priorities, in the manifesto, we are, we are saying we need to reroute CETA funding towards internship development in municipalities. Because you've got all these graduates in the country, whether it's engineers, accountants, and so HR practitioners, and struggling municipalities, and these people are at home in a local vicinity. Right. So you need to re so that because <clears throat> they, we, we must be honest, you know, there is a problem of stability at municipal level, mm. and so we can't just send money there without. That's a Canton mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without building the necessary infrastructure and deploying the right skills. But you have those skills. You are turning out graduates every single year that, by the way, you are funding through NSFAS. So the conveyor belt of uh, spending stops there. Um, and it just doesn't make sense. In fact, what we have, uh, what we are saying is that the, the disconnect as well is that you want people to move and that's why you've got this heightened level of um, ur uh, rural urban migration because everybody is anticipating that jobs are in the cities. Yet there's a municipality everywhere in the country which has got a competence of, for development but yet we have limited um, its scope. So it's also part to say, yeah, good and well, we will not bring you the money but we're going to couple it uh, 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 with the skills so that... <clears throat> Let me make an example. I'm from the south of Goslu Natal. We were, uh, you you would know, bananas, the, the blue <laughs> plastic bags were a, a a daily lived feature of your eyesight on the south coast. That's a shadow of his for myself. Now it doesn't happen. Yet you're speaking about uh, food security, agriculture being competent. So we are saying we need to go back to those basics and find out why it failed. Do you need agricultural skills? Plug them in there. You've got them in the country. So the CETA work is so important in that regard to deal in part with the issue you are raising. So <clears throat> to the point that you made just now, and I agree with you that everyone migrating to the major areas is uh, is an issue and we need to find. So, and but clearly this is linked to two things. So you would know, for example, that there used to be a very competent network that was servicing the entire KZN South Coast. So, you know, I remember as a kid, I could hop onto a train from Durban and go down to uh, to Park Rainey for the day and then come back uh, on the train very safely. And But again, clearly, that's not something that you're able to fix in the short term. But if you're going to focus on spots where you can say, right, this can become a hub where we can now start development in KZN, where, where would you pick those spots? So, and, and just, but Give us the reasoning behind it. I'm not uh, trying to get a sense of, uh, no, no, no. of putting you on the spot. KZN Midlands, for example, um, linked to um, Pumalanga, um, is a tourism destination. So tourism... The Midlands big, meander you're talking not that the Midlands meander, you go to Sandra and you go to, you go to Rocks Drift in yeah, Singh and so on. So you've got that belt um, there. You've got the Midlands meander. You've got the Drakensberg Mountains leading you um, to um, Lesotho and so on and the Free State. So you've got a, you don't even have to, you're not building anything new. These are historic sites. These are historic landmarks, which you just need to build up your hospitality and tourism sector on. It generates you income, it gen in levies and so on, able to make money. You've got people whom can work in those spaces. So Umalanga, um, that's, that, that, that's one. It's, it's a low-hanging fruit. Agricultural development, like I'm saying now, food security, 
uh, you're not short of those areas. You've got, in fact, it, it goes to the land question that I'm about to raise now to say <clears throat> the whole notion of expropriation, expropriation, I just think it's it, it, it's sloganeering uh, without zooming into the reality that these are all things provided for in two. The state already has access to this land if in one way it also owns it. So it's not a matter of uh, land not being available, it's an inability to utilize the land correctly. You need to, of course, again, go to the issue of skills, expertise, knowledge, and creating the conveyor belt to the extent of beneficiation as well as part of your rail networks and the whole, the whole yada yada. <clears throat> so you've got Agriculture is a backbone of the economy, you know, and you could be you could make it work and beneficiate around it. Then there is a, we've got a, a country rich in mineral resources and uh, many material diversities. Rebuild the rural, the mining towns, and be able to go back to those um, operations. Why do you have zama zamas? It's, the zama zamas are there because the minerals are still there. So you have left an entire uh, space, right, of mineral extraction to its own devices, and the Zamazamas have moved in. They would not go there if there was not anything there. So you need to be able to say, how do you maximize um, on that as well? So again, I, I make the point that our outlook really in the IFP is to say, we need to go back to basics. Um, we th these the, these things are all practically and realistically there. Rebuilding the, the 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 rail network is also about the preservation of your road infrastructure, right? It's also about efficiency of movement. Yeah, and the of same goods. goes for sewerage mm. infrastructure yeah. and everything else yeah. that has ruined that place yeah. for holiday. <clears throat> uh, Sweet Peace says a holiday maker left our area over Easter, vowing never to return. No water, E. coli beaches, and then she said earlier. I live in Durban. KZN is fucked. This is her word. It says nothing works. I've just driven a huge part of northern KZN. Cows and goats rule the roads. Infrastructure is totally broken. No, no, it's, it's, it's correct. I mean, in fact, one of the things we have said to our municipalities is, is to have these stock pounds um, developed in order for you to be able to collect these roaming animals because they're also a risk, particularly at night, in terms of um, road and uh, road accidents. So it's very, very important that uh, you do that. But it's also about the management of animal disease as well, because you're going to have heightened movement of animals that is uncontrolled, and then all sorts of things happen in that uh, space. Um, potholes um, should ordinarily not. Let me make an example. If you drive from uh, King Inlovu, Eshowe, Melmoth to Freyhead. Our municipalities are unable to touch that road. So you've got Umlalazi, Mtonyaneni, um, Ulundi, Abakulusi municipality who are all on that road. Major artery. They can't touch it because it's a provincial competence. Right? Exactly. To what you are saying. Yet, the, the functionality and economic uh, 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 reliance of, our, of those municipalities rests on that road. Then uh, you've got now, because of the heightened traffic from Pumalanga to via Pongola to uh, Richards Bay, the truck's rerouting onto that road. So it's degradation, you know, the, the pace is quickened because of the heightened trucks. And then the municipalities can't touch it. So again, it's it, it's about empowering your municipalities to do the things which are in the collective interest um, or, 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 or of the people residing there. Also, it's not just damage to vehicles, this uh, portals thing. It's also accident inducing. So it's part of you, we, every year we have a drive to say, be safe. We've just come out of a horrific uh, Easter weekend in so far as uh, road accidents are, are concerned. In part, the contributing factor is not, yes, this, it's good that we are focusing on don't drink and drive. I'm wholly for responsible driving. But a responsible driver needs to be able to drive also on a functional road. Mm. Mm. So all of this, <clears throat> and almost all the comments are talking about definitely a level of competence coming from you. They they love the way that you are honest and that you speak out about all of these things. And these are things that voters uh, are looking at and looking out for. And in your, in the last few minutes, right, in your own words, why should any of the people listening today or any young person who's voting for the first time, vote for the IFP. 
Got a track which backs up what we are saying. Sorry, just say, <clears throat> that, say that again. We missed. You've got a track record. We've got a track record which backs up what we are saying. When we speak about development and localizing things, we've done that. So let me make uh, uh, an example in Guazulu Natal. And yes, I know there will be criticism, constant reference to Guazulu Natal, but that's where we've governed. We built colleges of education to ensure that the kind of teacher turnout that we are putting out was one which was fit for purpose, dedicated to that. Now you've got them converted to TVET colleges, which is not a bad thing, but you are borrowing from Pete. You, you, you are not, I mean, you are, you compare you are, the numbers with on with what, uh, what we have left now. You're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. Right. So you shut down teacher education colleges to open a TVET. Why couldn't you build that up? So we had those built. Over 6,000 classrooms built in rural communities for, for, for ease of access to education. Amongst others, to push back on the frontiers of the long distances that children have to travel, taking schools to the communities as opposed to kids going to schools, if I'm making sense. There was a concerted effort to ensure access to healthcare by building clinics in the most remote of areas. We... As, as the water development, we laid a solid foundation for access to water in Wazlu Natal in the municipalities that we governed from Zululand, Mkanyagute, Ilembe, Ugu, um, and Sisonke district, and, and so Utugela and Amatub. And it was unfortunate that we were taken out of power because the next phase of that was to ensure that water reached the households. But the basis of the infrastructure that is being, well, no, that is supposed to be used now came from us. So every time we have made a commitment, we have seen it through. That's point number one. Secondly, we are not shy to enforce consequence management. We have removed mayors. We have removed councillors when we have felt that they are not working in the interests um, of the people. No party willingly goes into a by-election knowing the risks that come with it. But if we've had to fire a councillor, we have done so because we believe that we are a public good. Three, we are not uh, uh, allergic to criticism. And we, the, 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 the strength of our growth relies because we've been receiving feedback from the membership of the party to tell us that leadership do one, two, three, and four. And the fourth aspect is, is that we are accountable and we are honest uh, on the things that uh, uh, matter. We're not, a, we're not populist. And maybe that's why we don't make the headlines and the front pages, because we are not going to say something for the sake of saying it. And maybe finally, let me say, we will not oppose for the sake of opposing. Because ultimately, we've got a national responsibility to build this country. So, for example, if you're saying, here, I'm going to build a, a school for a community that's needy, right, and making money for it, the knee-jerk reaction of an opposition party is to vote no. But the key question is, do those people need that? That's what you need to ask. Yes, they do. Ours is to support the efforts of ensuring that it is realized within budget, within time, so that people can access it. You've been honest with us this far. If you have delivered all on all of these things before, why did your electorate lose faith in you? Why I, did they lose faith in you? Why was think, your party decimated? I don't think they lost uh, faith in us. It's probably how we did things. It, it was a leadership problem. In 2004, I think... Um, the election was, you know, very hotly contested. We somewhat focused a lot on what we were doing in government and may have lost sight of the need to focus on party work because the two has to go um, hand in hand. Be in government, but be grounded as as well um, with the people. The second point is that, um, yes, the NFP dealt us a serious blow, right? Um, it, it It was tragic. Um, and so far as how it, it, it happened. I won't venture into the merits and demerits of what happened, who did what and when. I certainly believe uh, that uh, Mrs. Kamakwazam CB should have uh, should not have started the NFP. I think it was not to her benefits and to her interests. I think she should the benefit of the province. I think um, ambition management is very important in politics uh, as, as well. But um, yeah, so the NFP dealt us a blow uh, in, in, in 2011. Um, but I think that it, those 
experiences were necessary as a wake-up call for the IFP to never lose sight of the things that are integral uh, to political party affairs management and being in government. And so that is why you are seeing a fair balance with all the elements that are there. And the final point uh, is to say that I fundamentally believe uh, that accountable leadership is what rescued the IFP, as I said earlier on. And I think the smooth leadership transition that Prince Butelezi managed from himself to Mr. Shabisa has set the party in good stead because internally we had to get things right first before we go out into the public. It would have been pointless for us to have a mad rush and to say, hey, hey vote IFP. Yet mm. Internally things uh, were not right and stable. So just quickly, as as the, the chair of SCOPA, um, any comments on the Sivuwe Mapisang Rakula and what's happened there? Well, notwithstanding the rules of natural justice, which uh, say that one is innocent and two proven guilty, I think this is the correct decision um, that she has taken to resign in order to enable parliament to be able to continue with its work without the albatross of the allegations um, of the head of the institution uh, being in and out of court. Of course, we are a few weeks out, but Parliament is still uh, in session and it's still uh, uh, legally uh, uh, bound to perform powers, duties and responsibilities. If an, if something happens in the next week or two, you need a, a Parliament that is functional. Also, um, the, the, the dilemma was that uh, the responsibilities she had as Speaker, right, uh, amongst others would have been to chair the NA programming committee. Should not have been able to perform those functions. Some matters actually touch on her. The ethics committee, she would have been unable to share. Mm -hmm. She's a conflicted party. There's the issue around the salary of the secretary to parliament, which we voted in the House on a recommendation from the speaker and chair of the NCOP to only to find that the salary is now escalated to something else. So, uh, along the way, she increasingly became a compromised speaker and her continued presence would have compromised uh, the institution. I implore on her to subject herself to the legal processes in their entirety, allow them to run their course and for them to arrive at a logical and legal con logical conclusion. And finally to say, the law enforcement agencies themselves had better get this right because they, in part, have been an enabler to Criminals. people escaping yeah. justice, yeah. bungling cases, inadequate investigations, and a host of other things. And we, we, whilst we may attribute some of that to um, the state of capture, but there has to be accountability and responsibility now in to say a commitment to rebuild specifically the NPA was made. And I do not believe that the NPA um, in this administration and in this term has done justice to the commitments that had been made. And so this is one case that must be able to prove to us that we are turning the corner and we are hoping that a solid case on the basis of the allegations will arise because of the consequences and implications that have arisen. The resignation of a speaker is not something we should take lightly. And she's resigned on the basis of a pending NPA case. They better get this right. Um, Kulegwa, I just want to quickly go to a comment here from Snae who said, I still remember this, uh, that's you, Kulegwa, disciplining a minister in the ANC, told her to behave like a respectable elder. Since then, I have admired this man. He is a smart, respectable man. And I saw someone else saying they would vote for the IFP, but they want leaders who are young like you. And then others saying, no, but they like Mr. Shabisa. He's a firm, respectable man, refreshing to see a party with proper elders and a system. So, I mean... <laughs> Somebody here saying, I like the IFP. Mm, mm. <laughs> and Mapello saying, you were very soft on this guy. Well, I said to you that uh, if I were a one-issue voter, it would be this idea of devolution of powers. And the IFP seems to be the only party that's making a big noise about that. Well, let me take this opportunity to thank you all and to... Yeah, I'm sorry about changed. the sound issues, by the way. I don't know what's happened this um, morning. Jesus. And to say that uh, we, we, we will continue to be available to South Africans. And we are a work in progress. We are a party that 
is committed to this country. And we are making a clarion call to say, even if in the sad event that you don't vote for us, but please go out and exercise your right to vote. It is of critical importance. So as far as uh, we are concerned as the IFP, uh, it is in the hands of the citizens. And we are presenting ourselves as a credible and viable alternative. And I encourage everybody to go to www.ifp.org.za and you'll find the 13-point plan manifesto of the IFP there and other issues. And if in all honesty, there's a matter that you'd like to raise with us, um, I can be reached and will be able to direct you correctly on 071-111-0539. 0539 We have not had any politicians give out their personal cell phone number. number? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it, WhatsApp and calls in the event wow. that I can't take your call, I will respond to your WhatsApp and will direct you uh, to wherever and however we may be of assistance or whatever you need um, from the IFP. Um, and you like that, Canton, huh? And and the IFP. I have yeah. my number out there. Yeah. So, but guys, um, thank you very much, and all the best to you guys as well. Thank Everybody you. wishes the the political parties well, but they, the media sort of carries this election. Yeah, as well. we're not the media. We're you, just uh, one you, one of the places. Well, you, well, we're not the you, media. well, we're just a bunch of the, media's diverse. Mm. So, and you have to deal with us and engage us yeah. and all sorts of energies. But um, my well wishes to you. Take care. Godspeed and Same God to you, bless man. South Africa. Uh, thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you very much, thank guys. You. All right, very, very happy, good. Was it happy Thursday? Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm sorry about the sound uh, issues. Happy day, says Pumi, and that's where we're going to end it. But the IFP, all their information will be in the show notes as well. Uh, we're getting closer and closer to those all important elections. Including and if you have 071 triple one zero 55 days, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you remember the number. Did you just identically memorize that number? Is that what you just did? Yeah, it did, like sure. proper. Unbelievable. That's why we keep cancer. For work around. only. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye. Yes.